So I'm really glad we could put it together. The book is really good. I thank you. It's very, very tight and very well put together. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this. Oh. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's good to see you. And uh, welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program um, Anthony Arnoff, and he's the, pr he's the author of a book that's out now. I want to show what it looks like right at the very beginning. It's titled Iraq, The Logic of Withdrawal, and you can see how it would look in the bookstores and so forth. It's a really very well-written, very well-researched and accurate account of the situation here in uh, uh, 19, 2006, August 22nd thereof and uh, he's also been the co-editor uh, of the voices of the again help me out with voices of a people's history of the United States with the eminent Howard Zinn I congratulate you on that and he's had an illustrious career as a writer editor and so forth and welcome very much to a conversation thanks for having me uh, my great good pleasure I, I uh, great praise for the book it's really very good but I wonder maybe you could we uh, we got 58 minutes maybe you could share a little bit of your own personal background where you were born and raised a little bit of education that sort of thing then we'll get into discussing the sub and substance of, of this book sure I was, I was born in California mm -hmm. but only lived there very briefly before my parents moved to Bogota Colombia oh really and I was there for three and a half years before they then moved to Bloomington Indiana Boy, you follow me because I was in uh, Medellin, Colombia yeah. for six months, did a master's thesis there, and then I went to Bloomington, Indiana to do my doctoral work. In oh, there. So we've well, got, there we're, we go. we're following each other around. Okay. Yeah, right, uh -huh. So uh, Bloomington via Colombia, mm -hmm. uh, and then I grew up in Bloomington uh -huh. uh, and uh, lived there, except for one brief year in California. Mm -hmm until the time when uh, I went off to college. I see. Uh -huh. uh, where uh, I went to Oberlin College in okay. Ohio yes. uh -huh. for uh -huh. my undergraduate work. Uh -huh. And then from there went and did a PhD at Brown University. And you did the undergraduate and graduate work in history? or in uh, My undergraduate work was actually in literature okay. uh, and then in my graduate work in literature and also in media studies. I see. So yeah, study yeah. of modern culture and media. Remember well the movie Breaking Away? Of course. What I a was fantastic... Uh, I loved Bloomington. It was really yeah. great. They had a barber shop with an old yellow dog, and it was just great. You yeah, know? it's a great town. It to is, yeah, it is. Anyway, uh, you've done that, and you're also uh, you have a political pr uh, uh, view of the world in a very real sense that it permeates your writing and so forth. You write with uh, Z Magazine, and you write for Socialist Review and that sort of thing. Maybe share a little of that, your own sure. predisposition as far as the, your political view of the world. Well, both of my parents were involved in the movement against the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and in the Civil Rights Movement. My mother was involved in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, and then they were involved in the Vietnam uh, anti-war movement when they met in California. Mm -hmm. So I grew up uh, around social justice concerns, and my dad's profession was teaching in the School of Education at Indiana University. I see, uh -huh. So a lot of his students were international students, mm -hmm. and I was exposed at a young age to a number of political concerns that I might, might not otherwise have been exposed to. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of our neighbors was Kurdish, for example. Really? So That's interesting. I yeah. learned at a young age about the oppression of the Kurds in Turkey and in Iran uh -huh. and, and, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, also, we had Palestinian, Arab uh, neighbors, friends, family. So I, I learned uh, some of those uh, uh, stories at an early age. So I think I was politically aware at a young age. Mm -hmm. I went to a college, Oberlin, that had a social justice tradition. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first schools to admit uh, women and, and, and African Americans Good. in the same program. When would that have been? I'm Oh, well, that would have been in the early part of the 19th century. Early yeah. part of the 19th century. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, that was in Ohio, is it? In Ohio. Yeah. And Yellow Northern Springs. Ohio. No, actually. That's it's Antioch. Is it right. Yellow Springs? Another important Absolutely. School, yeah. This is in Oberlin near Cleveland, about right. half an hour outside of Cleveland. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and so I was, at the time that I was in college, the 1991 Gulf War took place. Yeah. I organized against that. I brought Professor Noam Chomsky from MIT to speak at the campus mm -hmm. uh, during the conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where I became more seriously uh, involved in activism and began to see it not just as kind of a single issue concern, but part of a broader uh, project of social tra change and transformation. And that 
it wasn't going to just be uh, a minor part of my life, but it was going to be a really central part of my life. And your central part of your life came to have a, a view of the human condition and some of the means by which that might be improved in a maximal way for Absolutely. everybody in a just justice and maybe even an efficient and maybe even a historically necessary direction that things are going to move that sometimes are hard to see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, I began, for example, I, in college I read a book by Howard Zinn called yeah. The People's History Just of the United States. Just a great book, yeah. Which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I, in that book I encountered Eugene Debs. Uh -huh. Now even though I'd grown up in Indiana, yeah. uh, not too far from Terre Haute uh -huh. where Debs lived, uh -huh. and there's now a Debs Museum if, if you ever he get a He was Terre Haute? Yeah, he Why was in Terre Why do I associate uh, Debs with Wisconsin? Uh, well, there was a strong socialist movement in Wisconsin, I see, yeah. but Debs lived in Indiana huh? most of his life. Didn't realize. And yeah. died in Indiana. There's a oh. museum to him there. Okay. Uh, and he first joined the Railroad Workers Union in uh, Indiana. Uh -huh. So he had a rich connection there. He ran for president five times. Yes. He was a very important historical figure. On a yet, socialist ticket. Absolutely, as yeah. a socialist, including one time from prison. Uh -huh. right really? That's... And he never was taught in our public school education in Indiana. So then here I How am. Would he taught himself? He was autodidactic? No, what I'm saying, sorry, is I never learned about oh, oh, I see what studying you mean. Oh. <laughs> uh, in, in public school in Indiana. Right. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I learned about Davy Crockett. Yeah. Spent a week in Indiana or something, but not yeah. Debs, who was <laughs> right. this towering figure. Uh -huh. And uh, I was really struck uh, by the eloquence of his analysis, uh, his, his socialist politics, mm -hmm. which I encountered in Howard Zinn's work for the first time. Uh -huh. And that began a kind of course of study in learning the history of the socialist movement in this country and ultimately coming to see myself as a socialist. Mm -hmm. And you do now see yourself in the socialist tradition? Absolutely. Uh, help me out then if sure. you can because we've had this uh, evolving thing going on. We had the, uh, the, the, the great confrontation, the twilight struggle that they called against the Soviet Union yeah. which called itself socialist and socialism has been uh, used as a, a, con a political context for many revolutionary movements and so forth. They would re revile against the imperialists mm -hmm. and that kind of a view of things. Marxian, the distinction between socialist and Marxian, where is that to be drawn and what is the difference and how do we deal with that and is it important now that Francis Fukuyama has written his book at the end of history because sure. we defeated the Soviet Union, so socialism is now in the dustbin of history. Yeah. Maybe you could put some of that uh, way of thinking to rest here. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's important to say that the Soviet Union and what it really came to represent was something that was antithetical to socialism. Okay. It was a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. It was based on the ideas of Joseph Stalin. Uh, which were a complete break from the socialist tradition. Uh, and really, it was necessary to crush the generation of people who made the Russian Revolution of 1917 mm -hmm. on a very democratic principle, on a very democratic basis of the idea of working class people getting greater control over their lives, running the society democratically. He instituted a one-party dictatorship, crushed democracy, crushed dissent, and created this idea of socialism in one country, uh -huh. which is nonsense. Socialism is based on the idea of international cooperation, mm -hmm. international sharing of resources, mm -hmm. production based on need rather than based on profit. And okay. it's based on ordinary people controlling their own circumstances and lives democratically. Uh -huh. it's basically, it's the difference between socialism from above and some kind of imposed order from yeah. above. Would, would, would the socialism you're thinking of be associated with Trotsky? Trotsky it would be associated and, with uh, Trotsky's others, critique yeah. of, of Stalinism right. and the Soviet uh -huh. Union. Yeah. Trotsky's effort to keep alive the idea of socialism at a time when parties around the world said that Stalin was the model. Mm -hmm. um, but also before that, uh, with the, the seeds of the Russian Revolution of 1917, mm -hmm. the seeds of human experimentation that we saw in the Paris Commune of 1871, the, okay. the workers' councils in Spain uh, that were set up in the 1930s as a challenge to the fascists, where mm -hmm. workers began to manage the factories themselves, yeah. run things yeah. themselves. Yeah, Barcelona, one thing so. And Absolutely. Yeah, Madre, Madre, there was a movement there, yeah. Uh, and so that's it. So, so, the, the, so the idea that uh, the, the struggle, uh, socialism, the, 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 the significance of Karl Marx uh, 
uh, to the idea of socialism sure. or Marxism, as it's sometimes called. Well, I think Marx is central to, to the do. socialist tradition. Okay, uh -huh. uh, and his views have been completely distorted because people came to say that Marx led to Stalin, led to the gulags of, or of led Soviet to what's Union, going on in China now. or led to China or North Korea or yeah. any number of other states that have claimed the mantle of socialism, but have had nothing to do with either socialist tradition or with what Marx wrote about. If you read the Communist Manifesto, uh -huh. which is quite relevant to the world we live in today, even mm -hmm. though it's more than 150 years old now, yeah. it ends with a phrase that uh, in a true socialist society, mm -hmm. <coughs> the vast majority will rule in the interest of the vast majority, and we will live in a, a society which is a free association, in which the free development of each is the f condition for the free development of all. That's a good idea. Very good idea. Yeah. Um, and it has nothing to do with what Stalin was doing in the Soviet Union. So actually, I welcomed the collapse of the, of the, of the Stalinist regimes. Uh -huh. I think it cleared away uh, a brutal, uh, undemocratic model. Mm -hmm. uh, and it creates the beginnings of the ground of challenging people like Fukuyama mm -hmm. and others who said socialism is dead to revive a genuine democratic tradition of socialism from below, mm -hmm. to go back to the roots of that tradition, to clear away all the muck of Stalinism, mm -hmm. and to talk about why Marx's ideas are so relevant today, a world where, like, just take the United States, uh -huh. the world's richest country, mm -hmm. and yet more than 44 million people without health insurance. Mm -hmm. Inequality is growing not only it is, uh, rapidly. within countries yeah, right. rapidly, mm -hmm. but amongst countries, the certain countries are developing so much more rapidly than others uh -huh. that you now have more than two billion people on this planet living on less than a dollar a day. That every many. That's yeah. a third. Yeah. The and every day. Less than a dollar a day. Every day, people dying of diseases that could have been easily prevented. Yeah. Uh, diseases of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people every year dying from these diseases that could be wiped out immediately. We have the resources, we have the technology. It's and just we have not the knowledge. profitable. We have the knowledge. We have the it's just not profitable to do it. Yeah, we, we have the capability. Uh, it, it's very frustrating to have a capability, hard one, knowledge, research, that sort of thing, to take care of a problem that our historically inherited institutions and views of things won't allow us to do what we collectively know we're capable of doing to serve the human society, maybe even within a larger ecological context, and our systems won't allow us to do what we're capable of doing. It's sort of schizophrenia. It is. And it's creating a great deal of tension uh, when the gap between our capability and what we're able to realize is being realized by greater numbers of people uh, every day as things uh, muddle on through, don't you think? Yeah, no, I mm -hmm. think that's, that's absolutely right. And you mentioned ecology. Yeah. Uh, the current economic system we have, capitalism, it's mm -hmm. a global system, mm -hmm. based on profit, based on short-term calculation of, mm -hmm. of profit, mm -hmm. that is leading to ecological destruction because it can't factor in the environment. It can't factor in the human consequences. Externalities, yeah, they call it, Yeah, that's what right? they call it. So yeah. they, you know, factor that out. Right. Meanwhile, you're destroying the, sustain, the, the basis of human life on the planet. Mm -hmm. In terms of just simple things like global warming, uh, what we're doing to the oceans, what we're doing to the air, what we're doing to the trees, what we're doing to the human environment. Mm -hmm. But moreover, the economic competition, which is inherent in capitalism, it's built into capitalism, glorified by capitalism, inevitably leads to military competition. Mm -hmm. So that kind of military competition, once you factor in the fact that we've taken the technology that could be used to help feed people, clothe people, house people, give people meaningful lives, creative, fulfilling lives, Instead, we've taken that technology and used it to develop weapons of mass destruction, biological, chemical, nuclear weapons, that could destroy the planet many, many times over. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very important existential, significantly, a significant matter in terms of our lifetime, is it not? Absolutely. We've crossed an existential significant line in terms of destructive capability that now is in our midst. There's no question about it. Uh -huh. And the United States has used nuclear weapons, uh, yeah. used them twice mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. and they're now trying to lower the bar to the use of nuclear weapons by creating a new generation of what they call mini-nukes. Is that the third generation, mini-nuke bunker busters? Absolutely. Or something so you can get to Osama in his cave. Or and the idea is, oh, well, it's a nuclear weapon, but it's, it's, a, it's a small nuclear weapon. It's uh, a tactical nuclear weapon. So okay. somehow it's okay to use I don't, it. 
I, 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 I don't know if you knew, uh, Henry Kissinger wrote a very significant book in 1954 on tactical nuclear weapons, which was uh, a topic then, and it seems to be, be revisited. I wonder if we can come back a little bit more to the historical context. The Soviet Union, we had a twilight struggle, we had George Kennan, we had containment, the so-called free world that claims legitimacy historically, mm -hmm. and is still claiming legitimacy historically. We had that against uh, uh, a, the Soviet Union and then China after 1948. There was a great, uh, we fought the commies, or the communists as they were called, even though many would see those both as state capitalist systems that were developing and so forth, uh, gated communities, mm -hmm. plutocratic leadership element like everywhere. So we're, but we had that and that was a problem. And we had a system of thinking that containment, we were gonna contain that. We fought a war in Vietnam on the other side of the Eurasian landmass that we're now fighting, it seems, in 19, in, in Vietnam. And I wonder if there's any exa against that. And we contained that. And now, uh, when after 1989, in the minds of many, that came apart, that dialectic with this so-called enemy presence on the earth, which mm -hmm. is a socialist, communist system, like a red amoeba coming off from the Eurasian landmass, fell apart. We didn't have a traditional enemy like we had have. And do you think that's relevant, the, the things that followed after 1989 to try and figure in to how we're casting about for an element that we can have dialectic opposition to in the form perhaps of, they're called terrorists now or Arab terrorists or something, but maybe with some of those things in perspective, no, from your no perspective. No question that since 1989, the United States has been looking for a new external threat to replace the communist threat. Now we know, we now have the declassified records from much of that period of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And we know that the stated rationale for the need to contain or even to roll back the communist states was uh, much different than the internal discussion. So publicly there was all this talk about threat of invasion or attack or assault. But if you now go back and look at the, uh, the internal discussion, there was an exaggeration of the among deliberate, the power elite. absolutely yeah. among among people in the Kennedy administration, Johnson administration, deliberate exaggeration of the threat, deliberate exaggeration of the size of the enemy military, and so on, in order to have a propaganda value to justify military spending, to justify military intervention, and so on. Mm -hmm. But setting that aside for a moment, with the collapse of that order, the collapse of that pretext, the United States needed a new rationale for projecting its power globally, for sending troops abroad, for maintaining military bases, for maintaining the North Atlantic Treaty uh, Association uh, Alliance, mm -hmm. uh, NATO, uh, because the rationales for many of those things were that they were needed to contain the Soviet Union. Yes. Well, Soviet Union's gone. How do you keep those foreign bases? How do you keep up the military spending? How do you keep up the right of the United States to just go in and march uh, into other countries and topple the, their governments? or? rain down missiles upon them, you need a new rationale. Uh, and so the United States engaged in a series of, of imperial adventures, mm -hmm. let's call them. Yeah, the where Marxists would call them imperialists. Uh, absolutely, they were They call themselves globalizing neoliberal forces for good or something, but... Yeah, they have all kinds of rhetoric because, right. you know, very, rarely does a state say, we're going to invade another country because we want to dominate its people. Uh -huh. We want to make uh, their markets open to our goods. We want to take their natural resources. We want to have military bases in their country. We don't like the government. We want one that's friendlier to us, and they we don't, don't care that. what the people think. They say we're bringing democracy. We're liberating them. We're bringing democracy. We're fighting for free markets. And we're historical legitimacy is on our side. We represent the historically Absolutely. legitimate international consensus, and we have these few rogue people that we really have to contain. Exactly. Just okay. like the British did when they were the colonial power of the Sounds world. the same, doesn't Just it? like the French did when they, just like the Belgians, just like, this is not unique to the U.S. It's, right. it's a history of colonialism and imperialism. Rome was pretty good. The United like States just happens to be now a, a unique superpower wow. and that it is a s single superpower. Yeah, hyperpower, the French call it. The hyperpower, as the French call it, mm -hmm. that has extraordinary uh, economic and military advantage against its potential competitors, uh -huh. more than any other empires had in history. That's a very interesting point to keep in mind. And we did exercise that, if I may. The, uh, we're going to play a program next uh, 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 Vietnam. 
Uh, we, we exerted force there, and the, the analogies may be there to be drawn with the Vietnam. Uh, we got there, we had a, a, a Tonkin revolu resolution thing. We put troops in, we ended up with 58,000 American men and women of the military uh, decimated, and then something on the order of 4 million Southeast Asians that died as a result of that incursion on our part to fight the commies in what Mr. McNamara in the fog of war says was a mistake. Absolutely. And one of the things that I noticed is no one has ever gone in the dock for killing four million people. It just seems to be brushed aside in a way that winks at the moralists and will say, if you're strong, you can get away with murder. You're sure. above the law and the international law. And the only thing that matters is the Darwinistic, you know, laissez-faire power uh, might makes right kind of view of the world, and that's still operative in terms of the reality that operates on this planet? There's no question might makes okay. right. Okay. International law is a yeah. plaything of the powerful countries. It is. They write the history and the current context of what is supposedly legitimate. Absolutely, and okay. we can see that with, with regard to Iraq. For mm -hmm. example, Saddam Hussein was an ally and friend of the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States armed him, protected him diplomatically, mm -hmm. befriended him, helped him rise to power in Iraq, helped the Ba'ath Party mm -hmm. uh, that he was a member of rise to power, helped him crush the secular opposition in Iraq, delivered weapons to him, protected him as he was carrying out the worst crimes in terms of poisoning, uh, using chemical weapons, poison gas against the Kurdish population. Against the Kurds? Against the Is Kurds. Is that a Labja? In Halabja in 1988. But I that bet. was part of a larger campaign mm -hmm. called the Anfal Campaign. At the time, the United States knew about it. Not only did the United States say nothing to Saddam Hussein, critically slap him on the wrist even, they it's increased important. agricultural credits to him. They tried to blame the uh, Iranians for the attacks to try to shift attention away from there Saddam was, Hussein. There was some question of that. There was a CIA report that the gas came from uh, Iranian sources and that it had blocked you. There were reports that, well, I don't know if it was a false Green was, thing or something that was put out. They were trying to do whatever they could to minimize the disaster, not to have Saddam Hussein held accountable. Go back and read the press at the time. Very little attention or outrage or notice of it hard at to all. Keep, hard to keep track of our machinations because he was with us and we're against him and then we're against him and then Alec Glasby brought him into this 921. It's a real uh, Byzantine kind of uh, experience we had with them. I saw Jude Winiski. I don't know if you know Jude Winiski, the supply side yep. fellow. But he said at one point, he said he didn't quite know why Saddam was in the dock at all. Well, he said the cause is Bella, there was plant drilling, that sort of thing, and that the that he was sort of like, he kept the union together like uh, Tito. Well, the or thing is, maybe even a more heavily drawn thing, uh, Abraham Lincoln was vastly hated by people in the time he held this union together. And if you had somebody along the lines of Wilkes Booth talking about Lincoln in his time, it would have been something like what uh, Chalabi and others were saying about Saddam Hussein. It may have been way overrated in order to follow some sort of a political agenda of other people. I don't know if that figures or not. Well, that look, he wasn't that he bad. Was, he was an ally of the United States as he was carrying out horrible crimes. I mean, we, we should not minimize what happened in Halabja or Anfal or, or how repressive that government was. About 35 million. But he was... It wasn't 35 million. No, of course it wasn't no, 35 million. No, that's what million. I'm trying to say. It's the kettle calling the I hot under fly. I understand, but, but there's a lesson here, which is... All right, yeah, right. His crimes were acceptable when he was an ally of the United yeah, States. Yeah, that's They were the sponsored. Of, yeah. Right. Then, when he invaded Kuwait and threatened to destabilize the Middle East, and in the context that we were talking about earlier... He'd been lured into it, perhaps? Well, let's set that aside. Okay. That's perhaps a conspiracy theory. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. We don't have firm evidence of it. April but Glasby? They had a meeting yeah. where they certainly didn't send a strong signal of, we're going to crush you if you go into Kuwait. Well, so that's clear. A week but, and a nod, go ahead. But the, uh, whether or not it yeah. was a trap yeah. that yeah. he yeah. fell into yeah. or not, yeah. right. Right. he went into Kuwait. Yeah in the context that we were talking about earlier with uh. the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and the United States looking to assert its power globally and uh. looking for new rationales. Uh -huh. And the idea that Saddam Hussein had gotten too big for his britches mm -hmm. and our ally was now destabilizing the region, had done something that was seen as antithetical, antithetical to our interests, a region that has two-thirds of world oil supplies. Yeah. 
he had to be small put, matter. He yeah. had to be put in check. And now all of a sudden his human rights abuses mattered. Now all of a sudden yeah. the crimes that we had sponsored were trotted out to explain why that he was an evil dictator. They can turn on the PR right. or water so, on and off, yeah. So mm. that that's the important lesson there. Yeah. And then the use of power in Iraq becomes a precedent. It becomes what's called it has what's called a demonstration effect. Uh -huh. Meaning we've demonstrated we're the sole superpower. We'll call the shots. We don't need the United Nations. We don't need other countries. We'll do uh, what we need to do. You mean in '91? In know? 1991. Well, that, the, he, he, George Bush the senior had built an alliance of people. Even Syria and others came in on that. So it was a little bit more adroit diplomatically than what well, we're. It was absolutely now. a little more adroit yeah, diplomatically. But still the same uh, pattern. But still the same basic pattern mm -hmm. of uh, we'll go it alone. Uh, if someone, if other people want to help us out and help pay the bill, great. Uh, but we're not going to be bound by international law. We're not going to be bound yeah. by the United Nations. Right. We're going to set up a new framework of international order. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called the New World Order by George Bush yeah. Sr. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, it, it ushered in a period where we saw a developing of this uh, kind of bogeyman, really, mm -hmm. of, of uh, the Arab threat uh, and increasingly uh, moving towards the model of choosing to replace the communist threat with the Islamic threat, with the Arab threat, right. uh, and focusing our energy on that part of the world. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I wonder if you could, maybe since it's, uh, we're, we're coming out of a thing now, uh, the neocons who did that, I think Wolfowitz was writing things about attacking Iraq back in the 70s. They were uh, targeting that. Iraq was a large population, relatively large population that had oil. Saudi Arabia's small population, not oil. But Iraq were also very well known for being for fierce fighters in terms of a military context. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the neocon people who were advising and finally getting the strong support of Mr. Bush and so forth, were, um, uh, was, was the interest of Israel by the neocon, would the Likudnik or the right-wing view of uh, Israel seeing Iraq as a threat to Israel, they did bomb the reactor in 1981. Is the interest of Israel that we've aligned ourselves with so completely in the modern experience been part of the equation that prompted many of those neocon hawks to think, let's uh, decimate or break up Iraq because it would become a threat not only to us, American interests over the world, but particularly to our tried and true ally, Israel. Is there a tie there or what do you think? Well, I think th in the main, the policy has been driven by U.S. interests, not by Israeli interests. Oil. And the main interest has been oil. Oh. Now, there's an alignment of U.S. and Israeli interests, but that's not driving the policy. The mm -hmm. real thing driving the policy is, since World War II, even before the creation of the State of Israel, yeah. the United States has understood that oil is central to the world capitalist economy, mm -hmm. that oil is also central to the operation of the military. Mm -hmm. so it's fundamental to the U.S. economy, it's mm -hmm. fundamental to the U.S. military and to U.S. empire, mm -hmm. and that the United States would seek to replace the British and the French, who were the main colonial powers right. in the region, mm -hmm. as the dominant outside power. Mm -hmm. It would guarantee uh, the flow of oil on terms that were favorable to U.S.-based and, and Western-based corporations, and it would control in that region regimes that might destabilize the flow of oil, so uh -huh. it would contain Arab nationalism, movements like uh, Nasser's movement, uh -huh. uh, it would overthrow uh, a popular government, like Mossadegh mm -hmm. in Iran in 1953, mm -hmm. he was overthrown two years after he nationalized Iran's oil and said, yeah. this oil should go to develop Iran and, uh -huh. and help its people, not Subversive the, thinking. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, the U.S. has long Republican, Democrat, neocon, neoliberal, it doesn't matter. That's yeah. been axiomatic, central mm. position of U.S. foreign policy. Uh -huh. Carter had the Carter Doctrine. Yeah. We will militarily engage anyone who threatens the flow of, of energy resources from the Middle East. That was central uh, to his administration's foreign policy thinking. So this isn't a neocon thing. Mm. It's not a new thing. It's an mm. old thing. Uh -huh. There's continuity here. Continuity. But what happened is that it, a couple of things in the equation shifted. Iran in 1979 went from being a state that was run by a brutal dictator, the Shah of Iran, mm -hmm. who was allied with and loyal to the United States, mm -hmm. repressing his own population, 
that government which came out of the overthrow of Mossadegh and brutalized its own population, they lost control of Iran in 1979. Yeah. Then they began to lose control of Iraq in 1991 when Saddam Hussein, emboldened by all the years of support that he had been given by the United States, uh -huh. got a little too big for his britches and, mm -hmm. and aspired to a greater regional role than the United States wanted in play. Then, after the 1991 Gulf War, the United States lost its military bases in Saudi Arabia. Uh -huh. Remember that we had military bases They're going there. to Qatar now. They're, they moved to Qatar. Qatar uh, yeah. So now you're in a situation where the United States is in a weaker position in the yeah. region than it wants to be. Right. So it's looking for an excuse, it's looking for an opportunity, and they thought that Iraq was a weak government, an unpopular government that could be easily overthrown. Listening to Mr. Chalabi and company. Exactly. Yeah. Believing the, the lies of these Iraqi exiles who haven't lived in the country in <laughs> decades. Right. Who, themselves were hoping to run the country. It's and like talking to John Wilkes Booth about the character of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and, and then they uh, thought that they would be able to set up military bases in Iraq, yeah. get the oil flowing on terms favorable to the United States, and then by having its position in Iraq, mm. project power in the region. Regime right. change in Iran, regime change in Syria. Right. Uh, uh, this whole project, what's called the Greater Middle Eastern Project. Greater of, Eastern, that's for, yeah, the project for a new century. And then, yeah. if you're the dominant player in, in energy policy you can and politics the in the Middle East, mm. you can project your power yeah. globally. Yeah. Because look, the United States only brings in 14% of its oil. China from, gets, uh, from Japan the gets 85%, I think. 85, 90%. That was China started. gets its oil. Right. India gets its and energy. And those markets are growing. The European Union gets its energy from that right, part right, of the world. Right, right. And so you have a lever against competing economic powers, competing and you can take, political powers, yeah. competing military powers, and you can prevent the emergence, of, oh, ideally, this is the goal, yeah. to prevent the emergence of, of the future rival States, not just oh, oh, rival the states world. outside the area, yeah, like, but, right. For example, or you can looking put down the pressure the, to China, right? And so China forth. India, or India, yeah, India, right. the European Union, or and in, so on. Yeah, or in general, it would be a carrying on of the general white man's burden that we had in the 19th century that it was a European's destiny, manifest destiny, to control the world to keep, as it would put uh, derisively, the wogs in line. Absolutely. They called them wogs in the Middle East. They called them gooks and. But it's the it's the and they call them hajis it, today in Iraq. Hajis, is that what they call? Them? That's what they train the U.S. soldiers to call them hajis to dehumanize them and degrade them. Powell just, heads, that kind just of thing. as they were taught to call the Vietnamese gooks for the All same right. reason. They do that, and they have that attitude. And one thing we should realize, perhaps we're looking at things, is that that's the way a great deal of the world, after all, who remembers historically, like many of the. African Americans remember very well slavery, which existed in this country and much of the world. And much of the world remembers the boot of European colonialism in the name of advancing civilization as a legitimate order. Sure. And that's some dialectic that we should very well understand, whether it's in Vietnam or in Iraq or Absolutely. Lebanon. Iraq was occupied by the British. I have mm -hmm. a chapter in the book that talks about the British occupation. Mm -hmm. When the British marched into Baghdad, they mm -hmm. said, we come here as liberators, yeah. not as occupiers. That's what they so always say. Imagine, I think the Romans said the same, didn't they? Of course. They? Yeah. But imagine then when the United States comes in and says the very same phrase, we mm. come as, as liberators, not as occupiers. They have military forces in something like 130 countries, I believe, permanent more, bases. They have more, uh, more, from what I understand, from a uh, Chalmers Johnson has done yeah. very serious research right. on this, mm -hmm. uh, and in his book, Sorrows of Empire, he documents the number of countries in which there are military bases. Uh -huh. um, I believe it's now more than 130 mm -hmm. countries, mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate... There's it, only 189 in the world, <laughs> 191, I think, countries. We got, well, I guess there's a couple countries in, in the Pacific Islands or yes, something that escaped our mall. <laughs> is that the possibility? There's, but it is really overwhelming, and it's an arrogance of power that is exerted by that. Tremendously we mentioned arrogant. the uh, Ket Cotter. C Cutter, yeah? Yeah. That uh, they just had the emir or the head of Qatar was just on the television, it was reported yesterday or two days ago, and he came on much to the chagrin of Washington and of the world, and he said instead of joining in on the war on Hezbollah, he sang highly the pleasure, the, 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 the uh, success and the, the victory of Hezbollah in Lebanon against Israel, and he said that it's breathed a new uh, opposition to Israel, which has been there constantly for a long time, and it caused a great deal of shudders in Washington and other places that there may be a um, breathing of new life 
rather than a moribund kind of acceptance of the Western imperialist influence over that part of the world, and that it is through the, uh, the intimidation and the lack of invincibility that the Israeli IDF and so forth had been able to exert against Arafat and so forth, that it's breathing new life into an Arab-based resistance against Western imperialism. What do you think of that? Well, <clears throat> there's always been a contradiction in the Middle East okay. between a number of Arab governments that have been aligned with <coughs> the United States and, in effect, have been client states of the United States. That's Country. what we would want them to be. That's right. what we call a moderate reasonable. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, even though they're dictatorships that are beheading their own citizens, crushing dissent, don't allow trade unions, don't allow free press, don't allow women the vote, or so on, mm -hmm. they're called moderate. Mm -hmm. um, but countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Jordan, countries like Egypt, uh, countries like the United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. have been, have in effect been willing client states of the United States because mm -hmm. they formed a security partnership with the United States. They right. formed an economic partnership mm -hmm. where a handful of elites at the top of those states benefit from that relationship with the main imperial As power. As does a handful of elites benefit in every political entity in this world, including the United States exactly. of America, I notice. Exactly. We live in a plutocratic world. We don't, we should stop talking about democracy because we certainly do not, we have a truncated uh, democracy in terms of voting, which has some ability, but we definitely have an economic oligarchic plutocracy in every country in the world, including the international order as well. Absolutely. The system that we're asked to live in is not 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 nearly available to us what the future requires or perhaps allows now in a new kind of way that the socialist dream among others sure. might promise and maybe this new shift in the power balance against your pure realpolitik arms and so forth is being challenged in a way to make an opportunity for there to be a view of the world that is appropriate to liberating perhaps to use an overworked term the human capability and so forth within the socialist ideal I do you would, think? I certainly hope so. Yeah. There's no guarantees yeah. in history. Yeah. But uh, you can see right now tremendous contradiction. You can see how the direction we're going in is completely unsustainable. You feel that, It's yeah. leading to more Seems and more that suffering way by, uh, and, and, uh, and harm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you see that the claims for the system more, ring more and more hollow. So you, I do think, see more and more people wanting an alternative. Um, uh, what form that alternative will take, there's no guarantee, but well, that, there's there the possibility. Well, there could be a question about that. That's why I wanted to start talking about uh, socialism and so forth, because that's thought of by a great deal of what we call, you know, the left and so forth. That's been a dream and so forth. I have never a different kind of view and so forth. I, I, a guy named Louis Kelso wanted to spread ownership, and Muammar Gaddafi spreads ownership, capital, public, I mean, private capital ownership, instead of it being contained in a small class can be disseminated widely among the sure. general population. It might be the same, two different roads to get to a place where we have a system that really is just and also efficient in terms of liberating our full potentiality. That's a question that's still there and something to be reserved. But that we don't get anything of that in terms of our political leadership. They get no vision. And I, I was saying to you off camera, I was very dismayed when I viewed our president talking about we're going to stay the course in, in Iraq. I saw him on the television last night. I was very, I don't know, maybe he was tired, <laughs> but it was very dismaying that he was really unhinged. Yeah, and I'm very unhinged. worried about that. I'm wondering if they shouldn't have, with 10,000 atomic weapons, shouldn't have some sort of a stringent sanity test or something put down upon our leaders because they have in their hands the ability to apparently wipe out our whole species. And I've got four grandchildren now. Absolutely. I'm very concerned about... I think the reason, though, he's unhinged is a political reason. Yeah, is it's coming his, home to roost. His policy is more and more unpopular. His mm -hmm. presidency is more and more unpopular. Mm -hmm. A majority of people in this country now think it was a mistake to have invaded and occupied Iraq. Mm -hmm. It's plainly made the world a more dangerous place, mm -hmm. not a safer place, as mm -hmm. we were told. Mm -hmm. It's plainly not been... Uh, an occupation that's liberated the Iraqi people. It's brought them destruction and, and, and devastation of their society. Mm -hmm. And uh, so more and more people are reaching the conclusion that we should get out of there. That rather than quote unquote staying the course, we should abandon a reckless, dangerous course which is destroying uh, Iraq uh, and which is producing more and more enmity in the world against yeah, the United States. It, there may be hope in the enmity because it's finally building to a point where it would have some, it's like, you're too young to remember Ev Dirksen, 
Evan Charlie show. He used to be in the Congress, and he said a billion. He was talking about budget, billion dollars here, a billion dollars. It finally adds up to real money. You know, yeah. It was a kind of joke. It's finally building up to where there's going to be the possibility of perhaps questioning, as is so often accepted. You've got many people who are sycophant to a system that seems to be in order. They were so in the Roman times because there are interests, economic interests and so forth, they can be bought off, best democracy money can buy, Greg Palace will tell us, that sort of thing. They can be bought off by what seems to be the legitimate order, but there's beginning to be rumblings about the claim to legitimacy of the Western-led, Western power, the United States of America and its clay and allies and plutocratic running dogs, as some people might call them around the world, that the le supposed legitimacy of that order that they're trying to impose upon the world is coming to be questioned by a greater and greater number of very strongly motivated people with great enmity directed at this visionless kind of uh, system that's being perpetrated upon the world, do you think? It may be leading to where there could be a real challenge to the legitimacy claims that they have sure. in order to maybe start But the challenge can take different forms, okay. and, I, and I don't think we should minimize that part of what the, the U.S. occupation of Iraq has done is to fuel reactionary movements. That is, movements yeah. that don't have an agenda of spreading democracy and human liberation, yeah. but have a, a very reactionary set of politics that have a different explanation for why things are so wrong in this world and how yeah. to fix them. Right. And it's different than our vision. Um, so in some ways, it, makes, it might make some of our work a little bit harder in the short term. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, in times of economic and political crisis, it's mm -hmm. not always that the that the left benefits, sometimes mm -hmm. the right benefits. They hardly seen, ever. It seems to me like a long, long trail of winding up Mount Sisyphus. You have situations where, you know, sometimes fascist movements can be emboldened. And they noticed. have their own explanation. Or it's a wrong capitalism. explanation. Or, or state or capitalism or so communism run amok with so, apparatchiks. So I think we have to be sober about right. our challenges. Uh, and then I also think we have to distinguish between who benefits and who does not benefit. That's an important germ of what you were getting at because it's not the case that most people in this country are being bought off by empire. The reality is the empire has the same disregard for people in this country as it has for the Iraqi people. It's Look at Hurricane more Katrina. Evident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That I mean, was it's really, a very concrete well, that's moment. Part, that, but I'm saying that's part of the general thing where I think there's being worrying that they don't have a vision and people are getting wise to it, perhaps. Right. Maybe that's dreaming too wide, but things are going on particularly, it would seem to me, after this situation in Lebanon. Yes, well, look, there was a... They were firing rockets into Haifa right until the last day of the thing, and now the head of Qatar and other countries and around the world, and then we got Iran, we got a little clip we wanted to show the president of Iran, that they are now taking a very strong review about, rather than trying to be, that's a client state, Qatar, and he's sure. singing the praises of Hezbollah and Nasrallah. Well, so and there's the something blowing in the wind against government. Israel. Which is a puppet government. Yeah, so the United course. States it's also Vichy, you criticized uh, the Israeli incursion yeah, and uh, into Lebanon. They had 100,000 or something. And there were the demonstrations in Iraq. So look, in there's no question that the United States made a, a terrible gamble in encouraging Israel they threw to the go dice into and lost. To Lebanon. They thought They've it now was done it twice. twice. They did it in Iraq. They've thrown the dice and lost. And then they thought, we're losing in Iraq, so somehow maybe we can Turn strengthen our position by using. Israel as a proxy to invade and that Lebanon. Israel would and be beyond able, that, Israel, they were seeking to challenge Syria and Iran. And as Israel always had done, they could mop up on the walks. But they as could it turned beat them out, into, the and now happened. it's gone the opposite. So that's a double thing. And what's yeah. that doing is creating a new geopolitical reality, perhaps, against the assumed legitimacy. In one case, the most immediately vulnerable is Israel. I think it's very, they, they're all, you know, that's the thing. And by doing that, why do we send so much money, Apache helicopters, and support Israel? Is that in the national interest for us to do that? I saw um, um, the people, uh, Holbrook, the other day saying, that's an absolute linchpin of our whole geostrategic structure in the world is the support of Israel, and one begins to question why. Yeah. No why are we supporting Israel with Apache helicopter, three point billion dollars a year, I think, a year? Why are we doing that? If you start questioning that, you're questioning uh, an alliance that could then start bringing a questioning of the legitimacy of the power behind that, the United States, Definitely. which seems out of uh, out of keeping with what historically has been the case. We're just going to mop up on the world and whip the wogs into shape. Yeah, but look at uh, you know the cost of the war in Iraq. 
that's <laughs> now the indirect economic costs were recently estimated by Joseph Stiglitz yes. at Columbia University mm -hmm. at 1.6 trillion dollars. That's up to this point. He says if the occupation continues, as every indication is that it will despite your very good book which is highly recommended i'd like to put it up so people can see it again the case for immediate withdrawal from from uh, iraq and i don't know i'm not, well, go ahead keep talking i'll hold it up and you can come in on well this. i'll just say that he estimates that the cost could rise to 2.6 trillion dollars that's just the indirect uh, and direct cost of the iraq operation that's, that's about what we give every year to israel well no no, no. this is trillion I know, true. No, no, we oh, get billions. Yeah, billions. You're right. All right, you're right. So I'm sorry. I'm a whole sorry. hundred right. order right. magnitude. That's yes, right. Yeah, it's like have Dirksen, a billion here, a billion there. It adds but up then to real add money. in yeah, the costs right. of yeah. the expanding Pentagon budget. Right. Add in the Energy Department budget, which right. goes to nuclear weapons. Right. Add in the secret part of the Pentagon budget mm -hmm. for foreign military operations. Mm -hmm. Add in the CIA uh, uh, and uh, and uh, Department. Of defense, Add in the kind of black attacks ops on budget. civil liberties in this country, and Add the in the of that. Yeah. and in community after community in this country, you have a cuts in social spending, cuts in funding yeah. for libraries, for job programs, for veterans programs, uh. for basic social services that are vital to the vital to ordinary people, right. and yet more and more money for war, for mm -hmm. empire. Absolutely, well, there's connections that can be made, and that's some of those connections have been made. Uh, in the anti-war movement, uh, right, and so and so the, the the idea I'm getting is that historical legitimacy, which is always claimed by the Ancien mm -hmm. Regime du Jour, sure. I mean Louis the Sixteenth tried, and everybody would say we are legitimate, and they are not. That is beginning to be eroded. I think possibly, certainly on an international scale, we have such enmity directed against us because we are not conceived, we don't, we're not seen in the legitimate order that we tend to see ourselves. The idea of Vietnam, we had a trouble. Uh, they kept putting in new troops. We had Tonkin Road. We put in 500,000. There, is there a fear on your part? You, your book is about with, from. Is there an analogy sure. between what happened in Iraq? Uh, we made a mistake in Vietnam. Could we go along that same disastrous ca camp? Mr. Bush, it looked unhinged to me when he said, we're going to stay the course in Iraq. We're going to win, that sort of thing, against all the uh, empirical evidence and so forth. Yep. Um, what do you think? No, there's absolutely uh, all the signs indicate that they're going to persist in this imperial folly the same way they did with the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. We've already seen recently uh, an analogous situation to the broadening of the Vietnam War mm -hmm. to Laos and Cambodia yeah, right. uh, with the recent support of Israel's uh, war in Lebanon and beyond that the threat of, uh, of an attack on which Iran again came and a cropper, an attack on Syria. Which came a cropper. Absolutely. Yeah. But you go back to when the U.S. invaded Laos and Cambodia, no. that was after 68, after right. the Tet Offensive, yeah. when we now know the internal discussions in the U.S. military, top generals knew that the United States was losing. Yeah. Rather than acknowledge that they were losing in retreat, they intensified the bombardment right. of Vietnam. That's, is there a they danger of that? They expanded the war. There's yeah. absolutely a danger of that. In fact, uh -huh. There was talk earlier this year about, oh, we're going to draw down troops. That uh -huh. was electioneering. Yeah. In reality, they're sending more troops into yeah, Iraq, yeah. and they're intensifying what's called pacification programs. Uh -huh. It's going to lead to more... Pacification? We've got to burn the village to save it. It's going to lead to more yeah. massacres. Yeah. We've recently seen revelations about the, a massacre in Haditha, mm -hmm. about a rape murder mm -hmm. massacre in mm -hmm. Mamoudia. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more Abu of Grabe these things the, are yeah. coming out. In Abu Ghraib, yeah. they're not isolated. They're the mm -hmm. logical outcome of it. And as this pressure mounts, then there's going to be, great, there's going to be more paranoia. There's going to be... Like, he looked unhinged to me. Uh, sure. and, which is very worrisome because they got such, and then the thing in Vietnam it came that way and everything and we finally ended up and we were fighting a force that could not be we cannot even Mr. McCain would say we cannot lose because what's going to be lost they said the same thing in Vietnam it's commies we can't will be lose. in San Francisco we can't lose they're feeling the same kind of thing now and now the thing in Hezbollah and the, that was to be a forerunner to uh, get rid of Hezbollah and uh, con you know, uh, whip the wogs in Lebanon and that sort of thing, and then uh, we will be able to be free to attack Iran because Absolutely. they have it at that time. So that's another dimension of expanding it and expanding the neocons' cry for war, war, war against these people that we have to, it's got a colonial tinge to it. We got to whip them into shape and show them who's boss. Absolutely. Do you and think that's in the wind? That's definitely uh, worrisome. In the it's very worrisome, and if you think about it, much more is at stake 
for the United States in Iraq than was at stake in Vietnam. Okay. Vietnam was much less strategically positioned in terms of world geopolitics yeah. than Iraq is. Vietnam didn't have period. the world's second largest oil reserves That's or third, right. lar third largest oil reserves, right, which, which right. Iraq does. Yeah. It wasn't next to a state which had the world's second or third largest oil reserves, yeah. Iran, yeah. Uh, and which has the world's second largest natural gas reserves. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in a region with two-thirds of world oil. Uh -huh. It also is the case, historically speaking, that the U.S. said, going into Iraq, we're going to eliminate the Vietnam Syndrome. They thought, once and for all, we're going to bury this uh, criticism, we lost this in skepticism we about lost. Vietnam. We were wrong. And now, the opposite is happening. Mm -hmm. Rather than burying the Vietnam syndrome and giving this beautiful glow to uh, humanitarian quote-unquote anal intervention, be drawn. it's going the opposite way. Mm -hmm. It's delegitimizing American imperial power rather than legitimizing uh -huh. it. So a defeat in Iraq is much worse than a defeat in Vietnam from uh -huh. the standpoint of the very narrow interests of people like Donald Rumsfeld uh -huh. and George Bush uh -huh. uh, and the people who run the empire. Right, uh, right. And so they don't care how many more U.S. soldiers die. They don't care how many more Iraqis die. Uh -huh. They don't care if they've got to break up that country uh -huh. and foment civil war, which uh -huh. they are doing right yeah, now. Uh -huh. They will do that until the point at which they conclude it's detrimental to their economic, political, and military interests. And it may be the world is going to bring that about sooner than they might want to think. We Which didn't want to get out of Vietnam at absolutely. the time, and it was the, the last uh, neocon to come from the roof of the Saigon Embassy or something like that. But And it's, it's a very worrisome thing. Your book lays out, it's called, uh, the logic of withdrawal is laid out, the, and it couldn't be more highly recommended. It's very, very well written. I wonder though, we have a little clip, and people may not have seen it, of the president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, okay. he was talking with Bill, with, uh, you know, Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes, a couple of three minutes. Some people may not have seen it. I wonder if maybe it might be worth running. We could run that now sure. and show this little clip to introduce you. It's just three or four minutes, and then we'll come back. We're talking with um, Anthony Arn Arnov, uh, Iraq, The Logic of Withdrawal, his book, very highly recommended, but maybe we could a window towards the light for the president so that he can see that one can look on the world through different uh, perspectives. All are free to choose. We are all free to choose. But uh, please give him this message, sir. Those who refuse to accept an invitation to good will not have a good ending or fate. What does that mean? Well, you see that his approval rating is dropping every day. Hatred vis-a-vis -vis the president is increasing every day around the world. For a ruler, this is the worst message that he could receive. Rulers and heads of government at the end of their office must leave the office holding their heads high. How long, How long has it been the people since must continue to love them once they leave the office. How long has it been since the leaders of Iran and the leaders of U.S. have had any conversations? 26, 27 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have the least desire to resume relations with the United States? Should we do that? The, uh, do, do you have that desire? Who, who cut the relations, I ask you? Uh, that's not the point. The question is, would you, the President of Iran, like to resume relationships which have been gone for 26, 27 years with the United States. Well, we are interested to have relations with all governments no, no, and no, no. all nations. Please this answer. is the principle of my foreign policy. I know Allow that. me to finish my thought. Why don't you just answer, say yes or no? 
Well, okay, they cut it off. There was a little bit uh, more that we could have put in there, but that's just a look at him. He's the man on the spot in a certain sense. For Hezbollah, they claim it's support, $100 million gone for those Katusha rockets, and that the rise of Nasrallah and that sort of thing in the region is, is shaping uh, perhaps a new dimension in terms of claims to historical legitimacy is what I was trying to get at. And do you think the claim to superpower Israeli capability and superpower United States capability may be chipped away at and begin to be chipping away at their assumption in their la language of historical legitimacy and maybe making way for something that's dialogue of a nature that might be able to move over toward a human condition that you and I might more appropriately approve of? Or well, what? You, you have a dilemma, which is that uh, Iran is now being uh, condemned publicly because it's saying that it might at some point in the future develop a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have one. Mm -hmm. It's probably five, ten years, if not longer, away from having one single nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. That's creating fewer in the world. Uh, an outrage, you know, complete, uh, 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 you know, paranoia in, in the press. We uh, have 10,000. We have 10,000. Now it's a little bit lower uh, in terms of active warheads. That's okay. Israel, yeah. fine, yeah. no one wants to talk about that. Israel has more than 200 nuclear weapons. Yeah. Israel is not a signatory to the non-proliferation treaty. The same, the same. Pakistan is not a signatory right. to the non-proliferation treaty. Another ally of ours in the so-called war on right. terror. India, not a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh -huh. So uh, you have a situation where other countries in the world, especially after what just happened in Iraq, mm -hmm. where they look at Iraq and they see that Iraq was attacked not because it had weapons of mass destruction, but because it didn't. Yeah. So what we've done is we've fueled, the United States has fueled a global race toward developing a deterrent to U.S. power. Uh -huh. Uh, which means we fuel the global arms race, a global nuclear arms race. It's profoundly dangerous, mm. destabilizing. Absolutely. It's going to lead to a situation where there's a greater chance of military conflict in the Middle East, greater conflict of nuclear war. Uh -huh. uh, at the same time, it raises the stakes for those of us who have a different vision uh -huh. of a future without nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. without war, mm -hmm. without billions of dollars going to build weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. when people uh, could be uh, clothed, fed, and housed with those with, resources. And perhaps with a vision that would be able to serve the human interests of us all in a liberating way, which may be the real test that we have to come up with. Yeah. And one of the things that we have to deal with is this new situation that's emerging, and you can't do better, if I may suggest, than getting to this book, and this is by our author, happy to, we've run out of time, sorry, Anthony, Anthony Arnoff, and it is, uh, it's called a rock the, logic of, the logic of withdrawal, which Mr. B Bush is not in agreement with you on that, unfortunately, but he might do well to read this book, as we all might. And thank you very much, Anthony, for Thanks. coming in. Great pleasure talking to you. Best to Mr. Zinn. He's a great uh, hero of a great many of us. And it's your pleasure to have had the perceptions in of, uh, of Anthony, and we invite you to him. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Uh, we just sort of scratched the surface of a very big subject, but you've really done a beautiful job with this book, and I congratulate you on it very much. Thank you. We'll be coming back again uh, tomorrow, so please tune in. So uh, anyway, we got onto some of it. I, I, yeah, you know, no, you know, it's, it's, it's only such so a big subject.